Right now, 50 we'll tackle tough times in California. The economic troubles facing San Diego will be the focus of Mayor Jerry Sanders' annual state the of the city. Reports a 60% hike in rapes where either one or both people. Research track the progress of 50 sarcoma patients using From the KPBS studios, this is San Diego Week. Hello, I'm Joanne Ferry, and thanks for joining us. Tonight, the details of Operation Shadow Box, a dramatic sting operation that uncovered a weapons and drug trafficking ring in El Cajon and revealed a criminal connection between the Chaldean community in East San Diego and the Mexican Mafia. Plus, the San Diego State Watchdog investigation reveals more parents are choosing not to immunize their kids. And the Los Angeles Chargers, just a rumor or the inevitable. We'll ask the team's lawyer. That's coming up on San Diego Week. But first, the headlines. Dwayne Brown joins me from the KPBS News Center. Dwayne? The number of people out of work in San Diego County, Joanne, went up for the second month in a row in July. The State Employment Development Department says the unemployment rate rose to 10.5 percent, up slightly compared to June. Imperial County had the most people out of work with a figure of nearly 31 percent. The statewide unemployment rate was 12 percent. Grocery workers are voting this weekend on a new health care proposal from three major chains. They're also voting on whether to authorize a strike. Their union's contract with Albertsons, Ralphs, and Vons expired in March. The union says the chains want employees to spend nearly half of their salaries to cover health care costs. The grocery chains say their latest offer would cost workers $23 a week for family coverage. Supermarkets are recruiting fill-in workers in case there is a walkout. Results of the union vote are expected to be announced Sunday or Monday. Federal agents say they've taken down a drug and weapons trafficking ring. It has ties to San Diego's Iraqi community and a major Mexican drug cartel. El Cajon police say the group operated from a Chaldean social club on East Main Street. Sixty people associated with the club have been arrested. Police say the suspects were selling drugs, guns, and improvised explosive devices. And they were also connected to the Chaldean organized crime syndicate. This syndicate began in the early 80s in Detroit, Michigan. Crimes associated with the syndicate include murder, arson, weapons, narcotics trafficking, money laundering, counterfeiting, racketeering, alien smuggling, and armed robbery. Chaldean organized crime has historical ties to the Sinaloa cartel and the Mexican mafia. Police say the suspects got grenades from someone in the Mexican military. Well, you may be one of the many people along the North County coast who say something smelly was in the air on Wednesday afternoon, but so far, no one has been able to figure out the source of the foul odor. The County Air Pollution Control District took samples after getting reports from Oceanside to La Jolla. The agency says nothing dangerous was found in the air samples. A pesky palm tree-loving bug has made its way into the county. Agricultural officials are asking people to keep an eye out for the South American palm weevil because it could threaten the county's multi-million dollar palm tree industry. Eight weevils were recently found near the border in San Isidro. They kill palm trees by digging into the crowns, then feeding off them until the palms are dead. The county farm bureau says infested trees will have damaged The weevils may go undetected until the tree is dead. Usually the tax man takes money in, but right now the county tax collector is trying to give money back to hundreds of people. The county has $250,000 worth of unclaimed refund money in amounts ranging from $10 to $16,000. You can check the county's refund list on the tax collector's website to see if you're eligible. The deadline to claim refunds is October 14th. After that, the money will go to the county's general fund. UC San Diego's school colors may be blue and gold, but this week the school was honored for being green. The school ranked third in the Sierra Club magazine's annual Coolest Schools list. It recognizes universities and colleges for their environmental and education efforts. UCSD was honored for its cogeneration plant. It provides up to 85 percent of the school's electricity and heats more than six million square feet of building space. Now that's cool. Those are some of the week's top stories. Back to you, Joanne. 
As you just heard, police uncovered a major weapons and drug ring in El Cajon. This was not your typical drug, bat, drug bust in San Diego County. And here to tell us why is Tony Perry, San Diego Bureau Chief for the LA Times. Thanks, Tony, for being here. My pleasure. So police revealed a connection between a group of Iraqi Chaldeans and a Mexican drug cartel. Tell us about the Chaldean community in El Cajon. Sure. These are the Iraqi Christians. They've been immigrating here legally and illegally for some period of time, 20 to 30,000 in uh, Eastern San Diego County, mostly El Cajon, second largest Chaldean community in America, biggest one being in Detroit. And what this uh, investigation undercover uh, found was a connection between organized crime in Detroit, the Chaldeans, and a small group of Card Chaldeans here in El Cajon, and both connected to the Sinaloa drug cartel from Mexico. Very complex, very shocking, big numbers, 60 arrests, $630,000 of, uh, of cash found, 34 weapons, uh, three luxury automobiles, all sorts of uh, booty mm -hmm. from this, and, and it was shocking. It, it seemed to start, too, from what uh, police are saying, a social club in El Cajon. Tell us about that. Social club, 811 East Main Street. Uh, now, this is where the it becomes, well, shocking, not surprising. This place has been busted several times over the last decade for car theft, gambling, drugs. It's almost like uh, if you want to... Uh, bust somebody for something illegal, you go to 8, 811 uh, East Main Street in El Cajon. <laughs> this is the biggest one of all. It's where uh, the folks hang out. Now, let's say it like it is. This is a slender, slender number of a very large, law-abiding, prosperous in many ways community. What has happened here, while it is centric to this community, doesn't reflect on the larger community at all, I think. You, you described a little bit the Chaldean community in El Cajon, Iraqi Christians. We know that over a number of years um, have come to America, other countries, as um, some of them as refugees. Do we know if the people that were arrested, are they first generation, second generation, American born, young people? Well, we know they're young, and it's going to take a while before that kind of information shakes out during the prosecutions, 30 of which I believe are going to occur in federal court, 30 in, uh, in state court. What we also don't quite know yet. Are they small fry mm -hmm. in a larger conspiracy that uh, is ongoing, or are they m minor or, or even mid-level players? We're going to have to find this out. The police chief of El Cajon says the investigation is continuing. I think he seems to be a realist. That one strike, as it were, even the big one with 60 arrests and a lot of money and a lot of weapons and a lot of drugs, doesn't cut the head off of a snake that's been... Uh, you know, purveying drugs in this community and, and this country for some period of time. Let's talk about weapons because we, we started off by saying this is different than other drug busts. And what really stands out in this bust, IEDs. Tell improvised yes. explosive devices, those things that are buried in the ground and are blowing up beneath Humvees and killing American uh, service personnel in Iraq and Afghanistan. Where were these going? Three exactly. of them apparently found uh, among, the, among the weaponry. Who were they going to sell them to? What were they going to use them for? That's the kind of thing we all want to know, and it'll be part of the prosecution. One tantalizing, scarifying uh, fact that came out of the press conference the other day was that one of the undercover agents was offered to buy a grenade from someone who said, oh, I can get a whole bunch of them from the Mexican Army. Very scary if that's occurring, and I want to see more information of that as the, as the prosecutions ensue. A lot more to know about this, a lot more to know about how this relates to the Mexican uh, Sinaloa cartel, also the Chaldeans in Detroit. We are only at the beginning of this story. Tony Perry, San Diego Bureau Chief for the LA Times, thanks for being here. My pleasure. The County of San Diego is urging parents to make sure their older kids have their whooping cough booster shot before school starts later this month. A new state law requires middle school and high school kids receive a sixth vaccination against the disease. Last year, 10 infants died and thousands of people got sick during the worst whooping cough outbreak in decades. Every student in grades 7 through 12 must get the vaccination in order to attend school this fall. There are more than 230,000 7th to 12th graders in San Diego County. And our latest estimates are that more than 40,000 of those students still need to be vaccinated. More San Diego parents are choosing not to immunize their kids at all. That's what a San Diego State Watchdog Institute investigation revealed this week. 
The number of parents choosing not to immunize their kids as they enter kindergarten grew between 2009 and 2010. In fact, San Diego County's personal exemption rate grew more than anywhere else in the state. Joining me to talk about what these statistics mean is Dr. Wilma Wooten, the county's public health officer. Doctor, thanks for being here. Thank you for having Let me. Let's start with this increase. What do you make of it? Well, while the uh, numbers, and these are numbers for kindergarten students, uh, from 2008 to 2010 increased from 2.5 to just over 3%. While those numbers are increasing, it still is raw, uh, small in the grand scheme of uh, all kindergarten students that are vaccinated. Can 3% of the students who aren't immunized have an impact on everyone else or what kind of impact could they have? Well in this particular case uh, there could be a significant impact because the numbers are clustered in certain locations. If that 3% was spread kind of equi uh, equitably throughout the county, there might not be much of an impact, but it, these students are uh, associated with private and charter schools, so they're in clustered areas. So if that particular school, a particular school that had a high number of uh, students that have uh, personal belief exemptions, if uh, an infection like measles, which is highly contagious, if that occurred, these uh, students would be at significant risk for uh, developing measles and associated complications. So if we know that the concentration is at certain schools, mm -hmm. what do we know about the parents who send their kids to those schools, about why they're, they're opting out? Well, we know that uh, parents typically are fluent uh, and edu well educated. Uh, but in general, we know that the parents are concerned uh, about government and also uh, being told what to do and also uh, about the number of vaccinations. So there's a, actually a myriad of uh, concerns by certain parents. Some parents uh, think that the vaccinations are associated with autism. We now definitively know that uh, uh, there is no link with vaccinations and autism. Certainly there uh, are environmental factors that could be associated with autism, but the research is, is we don't have the research right. to tell us what that, uh, the causes are right now. I, I know I've interviewed moms in the past who don't immunize their kids, and, mm -hmm. and they talk a lot about sort of the holistic exactly. movement. They really believe that good nutrition, mm -hmm. breastfeeding, those are the things that will protect their kids rather than immunization. Is that what you see at these sort of clusters as well? Yes, and we certainly know that breastfeeding is a, a positive uh, behavior, and actually those children that are breastfed uh, have less obesity when they become older. All of those factors are good things and good practices and habits uh, to uh, take on, but they don't take the place of vaccinations. Vaccinations are the single most preventable uh, action that one can take to prevent vaccine preventable diseases. I, I want to uh, go back to whooping cough. Mm -hmm. We saw earlier that there's a new law. There's still thousands of kids who mm -hmm. haven't gotten their boosters. Mm -hmm. uh, we had the worst epidemic uh, last year in decades. Ten infants died, thousands got sick, but this really wasn't about kids not being immunized. This was about waning immunity. Absolutely. Tell us about that. Yes, the epidemic is not related to the personal belief exemption. It really is related to waning immunity. There are five, a series of five shots that children between two months of age and uh, between four and six, of age, six years of age should have. After several years, the immunity that is conferred with that series of shots decrease. And due to research, uh, uh, 2007, our uh, the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices recommended that adolescents obtain a booster shot. And not only adolescents, but in addition, adults should also obtain one, uh, they should replace one of their tetanus shots with the Tdap, the TDAP. booster as well. Great. Thank you, Dr. Wooten, for being here. Thank you for having me. One week after the City of Los Angeles tentatively approved a deal to build a new football stadium, Mayor Jerry Sanders went on a road trip. Sanders spent this week checking out sports complexes in Kansas City, Indianapolis, and Denver. The mayor says the timing of his trip is just a coincidence, but admits the trip shows his commitment to the Chargers and a new stadium and entertainment complex here in San Diego. We think it's really important to 
see how successful these venues have been and find out how they've done the financing, find out how they have worked uh, the entertainment uh, zones along with them. The entertainment district is about creating jobs, about creating business, about creating new tax revenue. Uh, in all of these locations, they have put together these entertainment districts and they've been enormously successful in drawing people downtown, going to restaurants, spending money in shops and uh, all sorts of different activity that goes on that helps um, the city. Joining me now to talk about whether the Chargers could be caught between dueling cities offering new stadiums or whether L.A. already has too big a head start is Mark Fabiani, special counsel to San Diego Chargers. Mark, thanks for being here. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Let's start with the mayor's road trip. Is this, is, is this what the Chargers needed to see this kind of support from the city? Well, we've been working with the mayor and Fred Mass, his point person, for more than two years now on the downtown San Diego option. So we've seen the mayor's strong commitment privately for two years. But I I think it's important for the public to see it and this trip allows people to see it just because of all the rumors that have been coming out of Los Angeles in recent weeks. So it is important for us, absolutely. Uh, so we've got some public support, but we really don't have any money right now. Not a lot of money. We've <laughs> Nobody got. has any money. Well, Los LA Angeles does. Los Angeles either. does. Los Angeles has $250 million. At least that's part of this tentative ag agreement that they've come up with. Um, they look further ahead from, from where you sit. Are they further ahead than San Diego? Well, in some respects, yes, but in one huge respect, no, they don't have a team, uh, and that's an essential thing to building a stadium. But no, they want your team. No one will put a single shovel in the ground without a team. You know, Ed Roski, a billionaire developer, two years ago in the city of industry, had a stadium that was ready to start construction. Everything was done. He had money. He had approvals. He had his environmental reports done. He had exemptions from the state, no lawsuits. And yet, he still hasn't broken ground because he doesn't have a team. And until you get a team, it's really all speculation. But the Chargers need a stadium. So if LA's sitting there with a brand new stadium and a commitment and money on the table and San Diego's far behind, do you really have a choice? I mean, if, but, but to sort of look at you know LA? The team has had a choice for nine years as long as we've been working on a new stadium. The team could have moved at any point during that period of time and it hasn't because Dean Spanos and his family have a strong commitment to San Diego and they want to find a solution here and we've gone through ideas as you know at Qualcomm Stadium in Chula Vista, Escondido, Oceanside, National City. Now we're focused downtown and we're going to continue to work here in San Diego. So I think 800 million dollars is the figure that people are talking about right. for a new stadium public money, and I, I think everyone agrees there's got to be some public money. What do you say to the public, to San Diego, that, that could talk two-thirds majority into approving higher taxes or a new tax or money? Because that's what it would take in this, in, in this county is a two-thirds approval. For a new tax, but it may be possible to do this without a new tax, and let me tell you how. The public owns 166 acres of land at the Qualcomm Stadium site. The public is now paying $17 million a year or more to keep that stadium running each and every year. There's $70 million of deferred maintenance on the stadium according to the city that has to be paid for. So if we do nothing, if mm -hmm. we simply sit and play the way we've been playing in that stadium and we just play through the 2020 season, which is when our lease expires, the taxpayers will be spending several hundred million dollars just to keep that stadium open. Not to mention that piece of land is very valuable and if you sold it or leased it, if you developed it, you could generate hundreds of millions of dollars in additional revenue. So by monetizing that piece of land at Qualcomm, by saving the money that's now being spent, you have a, a lot of money to combine with the Chargers, with the NFL, uh, and potentially with other revenue sources downtown that would be applicable to a convention district or a sports and entertainment district. And that's how you make it happen. It's not by magic, it's by monetizing that Qualcomm site. Mark Fabiani, thanks for being here. My pleasure. Doing even the simplest tasks, like picking something up off the floor, can be impossible if you're severely disabled. That's where assistance dogs can be a godsend. A growing number of wounded veterans are getting these canine companions, and as KPBS health reporter Kenny Goldberg says, an agency in Oceanside provides them for free. Really speak. Speak. Good girl. It's graduation day at Canine Companions for Independence, or CCI, in Oceanside, and some of the graduates are excited. Some are a little sad, and others are nonchalant. There are two separate groups graduating today. The first ones to walk down the aisle will be the youngsters. Volunteer trainers have raised them since they were eight weeks old. Sit. 
These dogs are actually trained from puppies to be canine companions. They learn simple commands almost from day one. Rima, sit. Don't sit. That's my girl. So we start with those very preliminary ones, the sit, the down, the stay, the stand, things like laps so that they will jump up, to only the front part of them, onto your laps, a visit command, they rest their chin on your lap, and, you know, and several others that are foundation for the professional training that the wonderful instructors at CCI then do. At 16 months of age, the dogs are turned over to CCI for nine months of advanced training. And today, these fully trained dogs will be paired up with their new owners. CCI provides service dogs for people with disabilities other than blindness. The agency launched a special effort four years ago when it introduced its Wounded Veterans Program. We realized back in 2007 that there was a really great need to serve the soldiers coming back from the current conflicts in Afghanistan and Iraq. Like Marine Corporal Gabriel Martinez, last Thanksgiving, he lost both of his legs in an explosion in Afghanistan. He's been rehabbing at San Diego's Balboa Naval Medical Center. For the last two weeks, Martinez has been in intensive training with his new dog, Wonka. I guess I had good training before, you know, boot camp teach you obedience and all that, and so it's kind of, you know, I'm pretty good with uh, commands, and so I guess I could kind of tie the two together that way, but there was no combat involved in this. <laughs> Martinez says Wonka will be a terrific companion. You know, he's, he's as obedient as it gets. When he's working, you, you think he's the most, you know, solemn dog. It's, he's mellow. He's, he does his job. But as soon as I, I give him the release command, he's, he's a dog. He comes to life, and he, he's all about fetch. He's loyal, and it's, it's, it's the, I got the best of both worlds with him. Look at that girl. The dogs perform some amazing tasks. They can pick up dropped objects, open doors, and even pull wheelchairs. They respond to more than 40 special commands. Good girl. Amanda the Fourth, raised by Becky Rios, presented by Amanda Canones. This is the third dog that she raised for being companions. The applause builds as the young graduates parade down the aisle. It increases as people get their fully trained dogs. And when Corporal Martinez is introduced, the audience gives him a standing ovation. He is receiving assistance dog Wonka, a yellow male lab golden cross. That story by KPBS health reporter Kenny Goldberg. Since its founding in 1975, CCI has given assistance dogs to nearly 3,700 people. And now here's Dwayne Brown with an update on what KPBS is working on next week. Beginning next week, we'll bring you a special series on retirement in the Southwest. We'll have a look at how the recession is making it harder for middle class retirees to make ends meet. And we'll tell you about a new poll. It shows how becoming more informed can change opinions. That's all coming up next week right here on KPBS. Thanks, Wayne. As we get closer to the anniversary of 9-11, we continue to ask you a series of questions about how life in America changed since the attack and about war. Last week, we asked whether you thought there should be a draft, and we got some answers. Let's start with Jerry Dixon of Santee, who told us the draft is just another form of slavery, and slaves don't make for good soldiers. The U.S. Constitution Amendment 13 bans involuntary servitude, which is exactly what the draft is. Dan Jacobs of Mira Mesa tells us he favors a draft because those making the decision to go to war would consider it far more carefully if their relatives and friends stood a chance of being sent into combat. Well, we have a new question for you, and this week we're asking, how would you describe current relations between Muslims and non-Muslims in the United States? You can write to me, send me an email at jfarion at kpbs, that's J-F-A-R-Y-O-N at kpbs.org. I'd love to hear from you. And now, one more follow-up tonight. Remember the giant steam generator that was being moved from the San Onofre nuclear power plant? Well, the North County Times reports that it's arrived at a waste facility in Utah three weeks after starting its slow journey. Now, the trailer that carried it will be taken apart and sent back to San Onofre to do it all again with another generator.
You can see any of the stories you saw tonight on our website, kpbs.org slash sdweek. Thanks for joining us tonight. We'll leave you with a look at your weekend weather forecast. Have a great weekend. Good night.